Hello YouTube, Mystery Report Newsletter, and Tutor Subscribers. This is Terrell from Terrell03.com. Today is June 9th, 2020. And this is a Mystery Report for Newsletter number 12. Running way behind in the Mystery Reports, just started them up again last week. And you guys are driving the narrative here by sending in your questions. And the, um, the difference between a Mystery Report newsletter subscriber and a tutor subscriber chat should be removed from, from here because we had to just dis discontinue the chat program. The uh, So now, those in the tutor program, you get to send me questions like Glenn and Tim this week. And newsletter subscribers, $25 a year. Then you get access, Dropbox folder access. You get access to everything, get to follow us along. It's the way that it works. And this weekly newsletter program is all about helping people see God's wisdom in the plain sight using his three witnesses of spirit, water, and blood, testifying in the Holy Scriptures from Genesis 1 1 through Revelation. Once you see them, it changes everything. My decades of research was started off in the received text and dissecting and trisecting the original languages. And then after a decade, then then uh, I was led to switch over to the critical text, which is the New American Standard Translation, the New American Standard Bible translation, okay. rather than the King James Version. And because uh, I wanted to see the forks in the road, the book, the Bible I use now is a Greek in a linear Nelson's that shows the Received and critical text side by side with the majority text, and you get to see the forks in the road and actually see the Greek terms uh, that you're using rather than working just with the root words out of the dictionary. So, for this week, then uh, the discussion is about the firmament if you're a King James guy, the expanse if you're a New American Standard guy, and it's from Genesis 1 6 through 8. And this, uh, as you can see, this came in late last month. And uh, Glenn's writing, he says, Can you explain some about the firmament talked about in the Bible? My nephew says that he believes that it's mostly only 300 miles above the surface of the earth and that mankind has never gotten past that point because of that barrier. He also says he can prove with math that the moon and sun are not as far away as we are told. He's not a flat earther but still believes there's no way to prove that it's a globe. Can you put any light on this? My beliefs don't match his by any means, but I, I cannot explain the total meaning of that term firmament as is stated in the Bible. So that's going to be the term used by the by, by a translator, by a group of translators. And they sometimes vote on different ways to go with their translation. This is what uh, you're going to find in the King James Version. And which is confusing to me. I would rather use the expanse definition. So then this is the uh, the first part of the question that was asked. Let me first, let's first review what the Bible says about the term firmament. It's translated expanse in the New American Standard. God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let them separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above. And it was so, and God called the expanse heaven. So that's the end of the story for me as for what it's called. Whether you want to refer to it as firmament or expanse, God calls it heaven. <laughs> so that's what it is. Exactly what it is. I mean, there's few places where we have God calling things things, but whenever he does, then that's what, we, that's what I call them too. And uh, this is one of the first images in the Mystery Explained, this is the key to help you break God's true Bible code. Witnesses of spirit, blood, and water appear throughout the entire Bible. The entire Bible is set up in the same exact way with these two veils. Of the tabernacle of Moses, set up just the same way. Until a time of re reformation, then it's going to look like this, with an exception that the second veil, I mean this first veil coming from this direction, is going to be out here. And the holy 
place is going to have a double portion. It's going to be 10 by 20 cubits. Why the Holy of Holies is going to be 10 by 10 cubits. And there's a reason for all that explained in my book. The scenario leading up to God creating the expanse firmament begins in Genesis 1.1 with the creation of the heaven and the earth. That heaven there is singular, by the way. And uh, God, heaven, and earth are all singularity expressions existing in this perfect state for ages and ages. The ages and ages that were before us, that's from Ecclesiastes 1.10. Is speaking about whenever the earth of Genesis 1 1 existed as a perfect singularity expression. Try to wrap your, your head around that. No such thing as angels, no such thing as men, no such thing as galaxies. All the hosts lived on this giant sphere as living souls. God created each one perfect, mature, complete. No such thing as birth. Men, angels, women did not even exist. No, no idea of what those concepts even meant. Until we get to Genesis 1-2. And that's where the earth was made formless and void. Now the earth was transformed from this into this. But in Genesis 1, 6-8, the process is described. The water is above the firmament. The water is below the firmament. And the firmament is called heaven exactly like scripture says the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water this is a water witness helper of the heaven and the earth this is the heaven of genesis 1 8. we're gonna get more uh, really in depth on that next week that article is is uh already been outlined and mostly written this is heaven see right here Heaven of Genesis 1 1. This is the highest heaven. Heaven, highest heaven. There's a difference. In 1 Kings 8 26 27, Solomon speaking about his father David and the high the heaven in the highest heaven. Heaven in the highest heaven can't contain God. So how are you going to build a house for him? That's what's going on in that passage and second peter 3 5 is where the earth was the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water though the truth says exactly what god says without creating a single contradiction science and spit and scripture say the exact same things when both are interpreted properly i'm going to get to that more to that in in a minute so what i just explained to you here is verbally is what is written down right here God provides the answer of what this is by calling it heaven which is begotten all blood witnesses of the Bible are begotten there's the only begotten son this is the begotten heaven it was created by the waters above and the waters below overlapping the power from on high overshadowed the Holy Spirit and the Holy Child is called the Son of God the only begotten Son of God, who is from heaven, where my Father who art in heaven, that was a lesson from last week, gets his name. My Father who art in heaven, he's right here. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the Son is in the bosom of the Father, my Father who art in heaven, and Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is in the bosom of the Almighty. See the relationships? Guess what's in the bosom down here? Heaven is in the bosom of the heavens and the earth. It's in the bosom of the heavens and the earth. So many times, whenever scriptures, like whenever Christ says that I and the Father are one, he's talking about this Father right here. My Father who art in heaven, you can draw a circle right around him. You can say the same exact thing for the Holy Spirit. I and the Holy Spirit are one. Because the Son shares features and characteristics with the Father who art in heaven and the Holy Spirit. Where you see the Father and the Holy Spirit, are separated by the two veils and the sun they do not touch same thing with the three witnesses of the almighty god to come god who was don't touch they come together god who is who knows all things as they're happening in the present and the now right now everything this is his prophet this is his priest for the sun this is his prophet this is his priest similar situation 
with all of the three witness mystery sets. So your, your spirit is more your prophet side. Your body is more your priest side. Your king side is in the soul part that is begotten. It's like the only begotten son. That's right here. That's one of the keys of understanding God's hidden wisdom is realizing that God gives you some of the testimony in each of the three witnesses. Our job is to figure out who's a blood witness, who's a spirit witness, who's a water witness, so we can see the pattern. Seeing the pattern changes everything, because then you realize Elijah is testifying as a spirit witness. Moses, I'm thinking of the Mount of Transfiguration here, Moses is testifying as the priest, the water witness, like the earth, and all the men that are in the earth. Elijah is testifying for all the angels. That's why he didn't see death, like angels don't see death. They come together in Christ. They're all to be baptized into Christ, to become members of Christ's body. Eventually, by the end you get the, the time you get to the end of my book, you'll see giant realms of spirit and water and blood and angels descending on their ladder and Jacob's ladder being used for men to go up and the marriage supper of the Lamb and how everything is restored. They're made in everything. So let's get back onto this topic. You had to pardon me for a second while I shut off the AC. I guess it's getting a little warm. I didn't want the background noise to um, influence this report. So um, I think we're clear about heaven and the highest heaven. And the original question explained about the firmament in the Bible. And then the 300 kilometers, there is a barrier that's out there. Nobody's going to Mars or anywhere anytime soon because of radiation, subatomic particle flows that bombard and turn a person's body into cancer if it goes outside. So the moon landing, I mean, we don't need to get into all that. It's fake. Huh? 1960s technology, there's no, absolutely no way that they went through the barriers. It's the Van, Van Allen belts, the magnetosphere. All right. As long as they travel within Earth magnetosphere, they're going to be fine. It's when they get, that is the barrier that you're going to be talking about there. The bow shock of the magnetosphere, the magneto tail, magneto paws. Passing through that and interacting with the, in, in, in any spaceship that's not made of six inches thick of lead is going to have problems. And the, I put some of the links in here, the obstacles of space travel. And they're, the NASA is trying to say, oh, well, we forgot how to do it. No, we didn't forget how to do it. We're, we're still flying around tubes and using propellants that are primitive. A real space traveler is going to have something that tra he travels in that mirrors the solar system. That mirrors our, the way that our sun protects itself from the interstellar wind and us from the interstellar wind. Same Bow shock, heliosphere, just like we have one on the magnetosphere. And these ships generate their own mag magnetic and electromagnetic fields across the spectrum. So that as they're moving through, then they, if you're a Star Trek fan, they deflect their array. They have to have something because space is not empty. People think space is vacuum. It's not. And when you're going very, very fast through, then anything you're traveling in is going to be sandblasted apart, not to even mention the radiation. It's going to kill you. And weightlessness, our species, men, animals, we, our genetics dictate that we live in a gravitational field on the earth. This is the way that we were developed. This is the way it's supposed to be. Whenever you take us outside of that, our body begins acting strangely. And we, and we really can't get over that. People that live out in space for any amount of time, even just circling the earth, their body atrophies. It's just a not normal use it or lose it kind of thing, part of our, our genetics built into our genome. So the uh, as far as the moon and being di di different dis distances away, the Greeks figured this out thousands of years ago. They figured out using math and these uh, lunar eclipses, the start to finish, they were able to figure out that the moon was about 60 diameters, Earth diameters away. 
thousands of years ago. So there, there are mathematical ways. I put the links here. Do it yourself, step by step, and you can figure it out. 1700s, they were able to figure out the distance between the sun and the earth. They used Venus in order to do that. Then um, this statement, he's not a flat earther, but still believes there's no way to prove that it's a globe. Can you put any light on this? My beliefs do not match. The uh, more accurate statement would be that there's no way to prove to a flat earther that our planet is round, rotating sphere like every star, every planet observed using telescopes. Look at Jupiter, look at Mars, look at, you know, they're rotating spheres, the sun, rotating spheres, every star you ever look at, every planet you ever see, the moons rotating on an axis. The reason is because of the way they were originally formed from the original dust cloud, condensation, the gravity well falls as everything falls into it, it gets deeper, 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 and it rotates, it's rotating around, that's part of produces the heat, the friction, and everything required to make a, make a molten ball that then cools and over the course of time. So there's an evolutionary process with the sun, with the, the uh, other uh, celestial objects like dwarf stars that were that are like our sun. They did not have sufficient, you have to have sufficient mass to develop enough heat in order for ignition to take place. Dwarf stars are failed stars that just weren't big enough. To be able to go through the end to become a main sequence star like our sun that's about halfway through its lifespan by the way so um on the, this is something that i have to convey pretty regularly because people want to send me their their interpretations and no thank you i'm way too old for that like with bible interpretation for me people are at liberty to wake up in their beds believing whatever they want to believe every morning so it's a red pill blue pill thing a pocket full of red pills if you're a matrix fan and for the blue pill fellas wake up in your beds what you believe in whatever you want to believe we don't have time to debate this anymore that's where my time was spent for more than a decade at one website writing over 30,000 posts countering biblical contradictions for people no more time for that so if you want to go to the website Come over here and start right here with these introductory videos. Subscribe, get a free copy of the ebook version of the Mystery Explained. I'm happy to answer your questions on all that when you're part of the tutor program. Happy to do that. But sending me the work of other people saying, go, no, broken doctrine is trying to fix it. Generally, what happens is, <clears throat> pardon me. People mix the blood and water ministries of Jesus Christ together without knowing the difference. So he has a water mission that he was fulfilling in the four Gospels. So many people tell me, well, Jesus said to us, no, Jesus didn't say anything to us. He came for Israel only. He sent the disciples to Israel only. Israel was this, except the gospel of the kingdom. They rejected it. What Paul teaches is something totally different. Christ preached the gospel of the kingdom. John the Baptist and the Twelve on the day of Pentecost. So many people believe that our church, mystery church for the day, started the day of Pentecost. It did not happen. That started the third ministry of the gospel of the kingdom through the Holy Spirit. That was rejected. That's what Acts 6 and 7 are all about. Stephen, name means crown, being killed by Israel's own hands. Like the Son of God was killed using the, the Gentiles using Pilate, right? And John the Baptist was beheaded by Herod. He, he was allowed to die in prison. Christ, they demanded his crucifixion, but then they killed Stephen with their own hands. That was a third strike. That's what the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. They could deny the Son of God, the little s, John the Baptist. They could de deny the Son of God, big S, in Jesus Christ, but they could not get the third strike. The Holy Spirit was going to be the end. That's the the transgression committed, Romans 11, start at 7, and it's the transgression takes place in verse 11. Israel's transgression. Well, that's why Paul was raised up on the very site where Stephen was murdered. Should be over here. Okay, so that's the common problem with denominationalism, which is the mystery of iniquity, in my view, 2 Thessalonians 2, start 7. The diluting influence forces there to be 20,000 different denominations 
interpreting the same, the same truth in that many different ways. There's only one truth. The truth says exactly what God, what God says without creating contradiction, like I said before. So then, um, the, the, the simplest way to prove the Earth is rotating spheres for me is derived from an understanding of time zones, sunrise, and sunset differentials. So if you're a logical person, that you can visualize these things in your mind. The sun rises in the, the USA Eastern Time Zone one hour earlier than those locations 1,000 miles west in the Central Time Zone. Same thing with the Mountain Zone. Same thing with the Pacific, right? I go all the way around the world. Russia covers 11 time zones. And the sun comes up later, one hour later, when you keep going west, 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 west. Okay. So all your nephew must do, or any flatlander, flat person, flat earth person, identify two locations on our planet more than a thousand miles apart, east and west, with identical sunrise sunsets. Do that and you have a case, but it's not going to happen. It's never going to happen on this planet. It's a round rotating sphere for sure, 100%. I would encourage him to state whether his flat earth is a flipping coin or if the flat earth is spinning like a pizza above the chef's head. Which is it? So whenever you ask these kind of questions, it creates the visuals, and then the flatliner realizes he doesn't have a case. The flat earth theory falls in its place in the absence of massive regions of our planet having the same sunrise sunsets that we should see in the flipping coin scenario. In that case, half the planet would have the same sunrise, sunset, and that is simply not happening. Venus, for example, has phases. Many people don't realize that Venus has phases just like the moon does. As it's going around the sun and our perspective changes, if it's between us, uh, all right, then it looks like a new moon. If it's on the other side of the sun, we see it full. If it's on either side, then it appears to be a quarter either way. But some people don't realize that sometimes Venus is a crescent. Like the moon. It's just like the moon. And so sometimes it's brighter. Sometimes it's it's not as bright. Okay. So in fact, if you observe, and I meant to put links in here, if you observe the stars, planets, you observe them all, you're going to see they're all round rotating spheres. It's just that simple. But he is correct that there are barriers that hinder space. There, there are links there for you subscribers. You can click on it. Go to the research if you'd like. There are barriers. So I'm right with uh, Brother Bart Sabriel that posts in these in the Black Star newsletters every now and then. And uh, that the moon landing never happened. That was all fake. It was to ruin the USSR, <laughs> to have them waste their resources doing what we were pretending to do. That's really uh, That's really the way I see it. Okay, now, then... That was the first exchange, and then Tim, Glenn's nephew, writes. So Glenn wanted, he said, uh, I will let my nephew type out his questions. And then he says, it seems, this is Tim writing. He says, it seems that the New American Standard Bible has some profound differences with the original Hebrew and Greek. I understand that it was put together by some scholars from various denominations to make the word easier to absorb and read. The thing to realize is that the ancient languages are written in stone. They do not change. The way that they use the, the Greek that we use is not modern Greek today. Modern Greek has evolved like English language evolves. All languages evolve. It's normal. As people evolve, our minds evolve, we describe different things. We have words today that didn't exist before. And we, especially Americans, we're always streamlining and making things more simple. So if you're going to go back to 1600 English and a lot of a KJV only people, please forgive me, you spend half the time translating the old English. You're wasting a lot of time. And yes, you understand what it means. You can think in the old King James language, but the people you're trying to help do not. It takes them back in time. It takes waste a heck of a bunch of time. The New King James Version or the New American Standard Bible, if English is your first language, is what you should use, my opinion. So the, uh, and there are tons and tons and tons of old English versions that people get attached to 
It's like their pet thing. Whenever, if you're going to really help people, you want to speak in the language that we use today. But the way that we're going to think when we're reading scripture is using the old Hebrew and Aramaic, the way that it was used centuries and thousands of years ago, not the way it's done today. It's important that you do that. Um, so the first thing I want to do whenever something like this happens is go to the Blue Letter Bible and go to the different translations and then show you that they are the exact same words. Now, when you're studying the Bible, realize you open up your giant concordance. You're looking in the Bible dictionary and it says this word was used so many hundred times. That's not what it's saying, though. It's saying that the root of this word is used a thousand times in many, many, many different words. Okay, so you're using the root words. Some people think they're looking at the actual, actual words and you're not. That's where the, the um, interlinear Bible is going to help you because you can actually see the root and you can see the prefixes and suffixes and you can look those up and then see what you're really looking at. So the Old Testament is written in Hebrew with some Aramaic, but not Greek. Everyone with an option on how the Hebrews, see, everyone with an option on how the Hebrew terms are used has a bias. We all have a bias in one direction or another, which in Tim's case adds the connotation of dome to that firmament. So the way that we define things can create visualizations that lead us astray in the wrong directions. That's one of the reasons we have so many dominations. So this is the true nature of our universe being the blue section in here. Heaven, which is almost infinite, contains us. So when you look out in any direction, there's heaven. And then God's infinite realm, which is the only realm that's real, that's where we come from if you're a seventh-day person. Or if you're a six-day person, this is the only realm that's real. From our perspective in here, this realm is moving in super, super slow motion, like constellations. This realm does not move at all. For all the ages to come, ages and ages, thousands of ages are coming. This realm will not change the whole time. We're within one splint instant of the infinite realm. The only reason we, we can have interaction with hosts in the infinite realm is because they are infinite, even though we're not on this side. And the reason that I'm saying that in some of our lessons, you'll see that this is the same way that you are this shell. Christ in you is this red part and God in him is this part. And our, our interaction with the infinite realm is actually inward. God is incarnate inside of us, inside of Christ that is incarnate inside of us. Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians 1, is an incarnation of heaven that is inside of us. So this, these diagrams, whenever you change the names, represent different things in the Bible once you, once you be able to see the pattern. So this is showing the egg shape. And this is Colossians 1, 15 through 17 that helps you to visualize what the, to see that this is the truth of the way things are. He, who is heaven Christ, is the image of the invisible God. Heaven a shell. The firstborn of all creation. Remember heaven and earth? Meaning God created the heaven, the firstborn of all creation. Heaven came before the earth. For by him, heaven, word, Christ, all things, earth, were created. Both in the heavens, the waters above, and on earth, the waters below. Visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things. That all things, think John 1 one through three. All things were created by him. Have been created through him and for him. Heaven word Christ. He, heaven word Christ, is before all things, earth, heavens and earth, and heaven. And in him all things hold together. Just like this. The heavens, well that's what I just explained to you. But this is where we get into the relationships. We'll try to keep this under 40 minutes if possible. The heavens, heaven, and earth have the same relationship as God, heaven, and earth of Genesis 1-1. Three witnesses of spirit, blood, and water. 
where the water witnesses the oak, the blood witnesses is heaven, and the white uh, the, the white of the egg, and wa the water witness is the physical creation identified as earth. Therefore, we see a heaven in Genesis 1:8 and a matching counterpart in the heaven of Genesis 1:1. The earth below the waters of this creation also has a Genesis 1:1 counterpart, the earth that existed before becoming formless and void. So a lot of people get these confused, thinking that heaven is like a singular thing, that's, but there's the heaven of Genesis 1-8 and the Genesis, heaven of Genesis 1-1, and they're different. And then people get confused about people, because there are seventh-day people and there are six-day people on this earth. Some of us have a mix of both. But the difference, and you're going to get more on that next week when we go into the soul, is that the six-day people are tethered, their souls are tethered to heaven of Genesis 1-8, like all the animals. Everything evolved from the waters of Genesis 1-20. Seventh-day people, they're here to be judged. The gods from the infinite realm, seventh-day people. We have a part in Adam's recent incarnation in Genesis 3-21 when he put on skins. We're here to be judged. Our hearts are tethered to heaven of Genesis 1-1. There's a difference. Some are created, so the, the question about creation or evolution is answered by saying both. They're both true for the different races that are here on the planet. So then, um, using the word expanse invites the mind to think of that which divides the waters above from the waters below as something that is infinite. And I'm just saying, not for me. But he's on to something concerning the methods used to translate the original language or preconceived notions, speculations, creep into the translation process. For me, the combined heaven, heaven, and earth is a drop of water compared to the heaven word Christ containing all things in him. God's realm is the only realm that's realm is infinite with the heaven word Christ being an almost infinite realm and a drop of water compared to God's realm. That's the difference between infinite and anything that is almost infinite. No matter how much almost infinite you get, you're a drop of water. Until God puts his hand upon it and makes it infinite to be like his realm. So then, um, what is finite is the dome firmament, this is Tim writing, as the place of the stars, the lights of the day, and the night are all placed. So then he's going to give the scriptural references that are right here. There are also references, over 70 references, of 70 verses reference the sun is moving and not one mentions the earth moving. But that would have to do with the perspective of the writer that is standing upon the earth. The um, Several places mention the earth being immovable in the place and being placed on pillars. And then my statement is, your quote says clearly the firmament of the heaven. The firmament of heaven, agreeing with the statements from Genesis 1.8, that God called the firmament heaven. The difference is that heaven is heaven of this creation, all things. And the heaven of Genesis 1.1 Genesis 1, 1 contains the heavens and the earth and the heavens of this creation. The Holy Spirit and science say the exact same things for both are interpreted properly. Paul and the Holy Spirit testify this truth. There should be a space there, shouldn't there? For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal powers, divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. So God, the heaven, the earth of Genesis 1-1 have the same relationship as the heavens, the heaven and the earth, having our image. That is the image of a man, spirit, soul, and body. That explains why Christ Jesus who is heaven of Genesis 1, 1, who's the word of John 1, 1 through 3 and 14, is the man, Christ Jesus, from 1 Timothy 2, 5. Not because he's an incarnate heaven word. Not because the incarnate heaven word is a mere man. But because he is the same image as a man. So man doesn't always mean a walking around talking man. It's talking about the image with a spirit, soul, and a body, just like the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God to come, God who is, God who was, heavens, heaven, and earth. So 
So then um, Tim quotes from First Chronicles that their establishment can't be moved. All, of course, all things, heaven and heaven and earth, are contained in the word and can't poss possibly be moved out of him. This changes nothing about the movement of men, the stars, the planets, the moons, the asteroids, comets, and creation itself. All planets, asteroids, comets, they orbit around right, a sun, a star. They are moving faster, reaching the closest point, perihelion, and they're moving slower, reaching their aphelion position the furthest distance away. That is except for the black star and other objects that have magnetic repulsion relationships, binary star magnetic repulsion. Now that would mean, <coughs> pardon me, that means when their magnetic portal connections kick in, that it's like putting two magnets together the wrong way, causing them to slow down based on proximity. Pardon me, I had to get a drink. Then, good question, Tim. Right here's a good question. Question about the first and second veil. Are those the veils referred to in the Jewish temple that people could not look past? The two veils dividing and separating the spirit witness from the blood witness and the blood witness from the water witness exist in all of God's three witness mystery sets from Revelation, from Genesis to Revelation. It's the same for your spirit and your body being separated by your soul. On either side of your soul is a veil. Just like this, just like the tabernacle, just like this in the Bible, there's a veil separating the 39 books from these 13 and these 13. And this line right here is represented by the book that is unique to the entire Bible, the book of Acts. It has components of water and blood. It confuses a lot of people, but that's the divider. But the divine number of our scriptures is 13. Just imagine the 12 disciples, but Christ in the middle, 13th apostle. He's the steward, or he would be, he is in heaven. There's an earthly steward, Moses, over here. Peter was given the keys of the kingdom for these guys, kingdom disciples. Elijah's going to pick that up after we're raptured, and he's going to restore all things. He's going to preach the gospel of the kingdom to the whole world. We're going to see it from heaven. But we are in between these two veils. The prophets can't see us. Even these New Testament prophets. Peter calls these things hard to understand that people distort by mixing together the wisdom given him, the blood ministry of Jesus Christ. When you distort that, it's to your own destruction. You have to have the veil here and recognize where it is and not cross it. There are veils within the Pauline epistles itself. When you get more mature and you get more advanced, you begin to see them. 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 14. There's an invisible veil there where there's kingdom doctrine taught within the Pauline epistles. It's put there deliberately by God. It's part of the composition and makeup of the inner man of Scripture living within the soul of God's Word. And it trips up many. It's not going to affect your salvation if you obeyed our gospel, but it does affect your rewards, particularly when a brother in Christ comes and tries to help you see through that veil to get things right, and you criticize and condemn him for doing so. Denominationalism, bad thing. So the two veils of the temple are typical of what exists between your spirit and your soul, just like I was just saying. The key for seeing God's wisdom, hidden in plain sight, comes from an understanding of the relationships between all of God's spirit witnesses, all the blood witnesses, all the water witnesses, from God to come, God who is, God who was, down to simple bread comprised of oil, broken grain, and water. And everything in between. So in the mystery explained, you'll see charts of three witness mystery sets testifying to singularities. The blood witness in each case, down the whole columns, all those columns testify for the original singularity. In every case, the spirit witness and the water witness disappear eventually. My father art in heaven, he's going to disappear. Guarantee you. The Holy Spirit is going to be gone. No more work to do once everything is restored. Because the Son becomes the Word again. Look at the Word. In the beginning was the Word. Do you see any My Father art in heaven? Do you see any Holy Spirit? Any Son? Any that? No. Doesn't even make sense. The Word is the Word. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are all one. The same thing. We're living within the period from the time the Word was sent and sacrificed. That's how He became the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It had to be divided and then put back together again. That's where the blood witness was begotten. But then at the end, when all things are subjected to the Son and then back to God who sent him, 
But then you no longer have a son anymore. He's the word again. God and his word are one in the infinite realm right now. No need of restoration. The heaven and the earth you're seeing here are incarnations. Mere incarnations. I should say. So then um, he's unclear about Adam being murdered by Satan. These are things that you hear in my commentary um, whenever I'm trying to answer questions for, for your uh, supporters. These things are taught in the scriptures of, the, of God's living word. They're taught in the types from the word. Pardon me. For those with spir spiritual eyes of the new inner man having the mind of Christ within their hearts and souls. This new inner man's a big deal. It begins the moment you obey the gospel. And you either feed it or it's going to starve to death. You feed it God's word, particularly the Pauline epistles. All the scripture is living, but it's not all active. The active ingredients that you need as a member of Christ's body are in the Pauline epistles. He's the steward of those of us living within the dispensation of God's grace. We're a household under different house rules. Kingdom Bride, Gospel of the Kingdom, Peter, John, and James, different house rules. Try to mix them together, you're blind by, nomination, by, not, by denominationalism, and you're doing so to your own destruction. If you're baptized in the body of the Antichrist, obviously, but even if you're saved, the destruction of your works. Especially teaching the sons of God to do things backwards by mixing the water and the blood together. That is similar to what Christ says about leading the children astray and putting the, in the four Gospels, tying the rope to the uh, millstone and throw it in the deepest ocean. Don't want to do that. Getting so many people want to have debate. Joey, you're one of them if you're watching this video. He writes me all the time at, at uh, the website. Until we get your doctrine fixed, we cannot go into deeper things. It's like trying to build a house on sand. It's never going to work. And so many people, they want to run out ahead whenever their doctrine is unsound and everything's going to fall, everything's going to fall apart. So whenever I'm making that recommendation to you to go watch the videos and ask me those questions, when I, as you're asking me those questions, like we're seeing right here with Tim, that helps me to see the blind spots that need to be filled in and then we can move from there. But we begin simple things and then move to the more complicated things. And you have to convince me that you see these things first. Before we can go, we don't need to be going into Revelation. That's one of the most difficult books of the Bible to get right. You have to be a mature. That's what even in uh, about the Antichrist, he that has wisdom, he will understand. 666 is the number of a man. That's not a literal man. That's the three witnesses of spirit, water, and blood. The devil, the beast, and the false prophet who have members in their body. All right, so we... It, in order to understand that, you have to start at the beginning, at the basics, and seeing the three witnesses of Genesis 1-1, and then we can work in that direction. So, uh, this is the infinite realm where Adam was murdered by Satan. The things being done here are reproductions. God is reproducing the events in John the Baptist and Herod. John being put in the, into the dungeon, being brought out, beheaded. That's what happened in the infinite realm. Satan convinced Adam's brethren to do the same exact thing all at the same exact time so that the first God in God's infinite realm could be murdered. Heaven and earth were created so that he could be restored in the infinite realm. That's why God said, word, go over there, make Adam inside yourself again. It's exactly what he did. Ages went by. And then formless and void to recreate that murder then all the angels there were no such thing as angels in genesis 1 1 but when the heavens were created and the earth was created they were divided S singularity expressions living souls were divided their spirit went one way their body went the other way so your other half your soul mate is in the heavens nose pushed against the veil very concerned about you as the bride the body the other half, so that the angel can go to heaven. The angels go to heaven by being reconnected to you, a marriage supper. You got to take the woman, put her back inside the man, put the man back inside the angel. You have a living soul that goes to heaven. Eventually, all the men ever born, all the all the uh, women are joined to 
their angelic half to go to heaven. Whether they're on the paradise side with Christ or whether they're on the lake of fire side with the Antichrist. The, those diagrams are in my book, The Mystery Explained. The, uh, so that's the commentary from that paragraph. Okay, cannot find where the earth existed and was recreated. It was dark and formless and void from the beginning. No, it wasn't. Read Genesis 1, 1 through 8 again. The earth was created by God, perfect, mature, and complete. That existed in Genesis 1, 1. Many ages go by. That time represents what has existed for ages that were before us, from Ecclesiastes 1.10, as I stated earlier. There's no such thing as angels, that's what, I, that's what I've been saying, nor men, nor women, doesn't make any sense. That's why there's none in heaven either. It doesn't make any sense. It only makes sense in a broken universe. The reason that, because we're kind of on a science topic here, you know, interwoven in, into this, this presentation, the reason that relativity and quantum physics do not reconcile is because the Earth is broken. The universe is broken. They reconcile in heaven. So, trying to get witness and testimony from the Earth, the, this physical universe, is like trying to get witness and testimony from a woman that describes the family, the entire family, and it cannot happen, or your physical body to describe your soul. Many people today think we're going through prophetic times. We're not. That happens at the end of the age, that literal fulfillment of prophecy. We're going through the soul part that overshadows, mirrors, kind of looks the same, but it doesn't. It's not the same thing. In order to be able to understand what's happening, you have to be mature. And you have to know what prophecy says and then apply that to what Paul says so you can understand the soul events that are happening today in this mystery time that none of the prophets can see. Think about it. If the prophets can't see it because God was hiding it from the devil, then they can't prophecy about it. So you can't give them credit for seeing what's happening today. They don't see America. They don't see anything that's happening today. They see what's happening at the end of the age. And we can extrapolate from that what is happening now. There's getting ready to be gigantic persecution. Gigantic persecution. Just like at the end of the age. It's just not going to play out in exactly the same way. So that's uh, the story that, uh, or that's the uh, lesson that I wanted to share with you guys this week. Went a little bit long. My apologies. But for the benefit of Glenn and Tim, then rather than just read what's here, I'd like to give some periphery, some background information, and kind of connect that to last week's lesson and to the lesson that's coming for next week about the soul, about Christ being incarnate inside of us and God inside of him. Appreciate um, Glenn and Tim creating the opportunity. Appreciate you guys for your support. Get more information here at the website right over here. If you haven't watched this webinar, very, very good. I want to check her out. The threat that's facing us right in our face is the COVID-19 threat. And she's got the explanation. This was made in 2019 before the threat. But she's going to explain the importance of nano silver and how it boosts our immune system and, how, and what it actually does inside the body. Appreciate your support very, very much. Everybody that orders before 4 o'clock this afternoon. Oh, my goodness. It's already too late. My apologies. And my apologies for this being late. The I'm hoping to get this done before the power goes off. The power has been going off and on and off and on. It's been high winds here. And lucky to get the, it looks like I'm going to get this thing recorded. Hopefully get this thing uploaded before it's dark tonight. So um, thank you guys again for your support. Get more information at the website. And I'll see you on the next Mystery Report.